Hi everybody, this is Massimiliano Sassoli de Bianchi. The following is a video based on the PowerPoint of the talk I gave at the symposium Words of Entanglement, which was held at the Free University of Brussels at the end of September 2017 and was organized by the Centre Leo Postel for Interdisciplinary Studies and brought together many renowned thinkers interested in the development of an interdisciplinary dialogue about fundamental issues of science and society. Now, the reason I'm doing the present voiceover using my PowerPoint is that, unfortunately, during my talk there was a so-called Pauli effect and the recording system crashed. So the video of my talk is not available at the symposium's website and I, I thought it would be nice to do the talk again by simply recording my voice over the PowerPoint and here it is. So, my talk was about Diederich Art's conceptuality interpretation of quantum and relativity theories. This is truly a fascinating interpretation on which I have also been reflecting recently and I'm quite motivated in further investigating it in the years to come. But let me start with a little story. During the 18th century, the first British settlers who landed on the Australian continent were confronted with a totally new territory, both for the uses and customs of the natives, the Aborigines, and for the mysterious flora and fauna that populated those distant lands. Among the Australian animals, there was one in particular that struck the imagination of the settlers. Every now and then they could see it in the vicinity of the water courses, but being the animal shy, it was difficult to see it clearly. When they could have a glimpse of it from the front, seeing its flat beak and its two palmed feet, they probably exclaim, oh, it's a duck. But then, when it turned around and ran away, they realized that it had not two, but four paws and a dense four. So, they probably also exclaim, no, it's a mole. And by dint of exclaiming that it's a duck, no, it's a mole, no, it's a duck, no, it's a mole, in the end, they decided to call it a duck mole. In other words, they baptized this odd animal with a paradoxical name obtained by the composition of the names of two different animals. Such a designation of a dualistic nature was clearly only provisional since no animal can simultaneously be a duck and a mole. But when they finally managed to observe the animal more closely and more attentively, they realized that it was not a duck, nor a mole, nor the composition of a duck and a mole, but a completely different animal which finally got a name of its own, Platypus. Of course, prior to the arrival of European settlers, the Aboriginal people had already many non-dualistic names for the animal. Also, it is interesting to observe that the first reaction of the English botanist and zoologist George Shaw, who was the first to provide a scientific description of the platypus, was to believe the specimen to be a hoax made of several pieces of animal sewn together. This curious anecdote was used by the French physicist Jean-Marc Leville-Leblanc to illustrate the situation of physicists at the beginning of the past century, who, like the European settlers, were confronted with entities, the microscopic ones such as photons and electrons, whose appearance could change depending on the experimental settings, sometimes being observed as particles, moles, and other times as waves, ducks. And again, by dint of exclaiming that it's a particle, no, it's a wave, no, it's a particle, no, it's a wave, in the end they also decided to provisionally denote them wave particle or wavicles and so on. That is, to talk about them in terms of a wave particle duality. But in the same way, a platypus is neither a duck nor a mole, and certainly not simultaneously a duck and a mole. A microscopic quantum entity is also neither a particle nor a wave, and certainly not simultaneously a particle and a wave. 
The wave particle dualistic designation is in fact only the result of a fleeting observation of wave behavior. And if one takes the time to observe them with more attention, it becomes clear that what they truly are is something else, something completely different from the discrete and local notion of a particle, as well as from the continuous and extended notion of a wave, since both of these notions are spatial notions. While one of the most salient features of, my, of the microscopic quantum entity is precisely that of not being representable as entities permanently present in space or space-time. In other words, we know what quantum entities certainly are not. They are not spatial entities. And more generally, as we are going to also briefly discuss towards the end of the video, they are not spatio-temporal entities. However, knowing what a microscopic quantum entity is not does not tell us what it is, what its nature truly is. The same was true for the previous example of the platypus. Knowing what it was, what it was not, was not sufficient to determine its nature which is the reason why a controversy, by the way, lasted for quite some time among European naturalists when they discovered the very unusual characteristic of the animal. Now, understanding the nature of a quantum entity is fundamental because the behavior of a physical entity can appear to us very strange, if not incomprehensible, if we believe it is something that it is not. Whereas, its behavior may all of a sudden become perfectly normal and fully understandable if we can correctly identify its nature. So, to make sense of quantum mechanics, the first thing one needs to do is to find a notion specifying what the nature of a microphysical entity is. We know it is not a particle notion or a particle name, or a wave notion, or wave name, nor a wave particle notion, so what is it? The standard answer is that we don't have anything valid at hand to represent the nature of a quantum entity. But that's it. As Arthur Conan Doyle used to point out more than once in his Sherlock Holmes stories, sometimes the best place to hide something is to keep it in plain sight. Now, to tell you what has always been in plain, plain sight, according to the conceptuality interpretation, but precisely for that was very hard to notice, let me tell you another story. That of one of the boldest moves in the history of modern physics, made in 1924 by Louis de Broglie in his PhD thesis. Following Planck and Einstein's introduction of a particle-like aspect associated with light waves to explain their strange behavior in certain experiments, de Broglie, reasoning in a specular way, introduced the hypothesis that a wave-like aspect should also be associated with physical entities that until to that moment, were only considered to be corpuscle, like electrons, neutrons, and protons. And like with all new wild ideas, physicists were initially very unsure about the value of de Broglie hypothesis. Fortunately, Langevin had the foresight to send a copy of his thesis to Einstein, who was immediately conquered by the idea, so that de Broglie was ultimately granted his doctorate. The rest is history. A few years later, Davison and Germer in the USA and Thomson's in Scotland confirmed by means of diffraction experiments that electrons could also behave similarly to waves. And in 1929, de Broglie was then awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of the wave aspect of electrons, which, as we know, then laid the foundations of quantum mechanics. If I'm telling you about de Broglie's move, it is because in 2009, Diederik Arts made a similar move that is also the result 
of a bold specular reasoning. Our starting point is the successes of quantum cognition, of which, by the way, he is one of the pioneers. In a nutshell, quantum cognition is a research program based on the application of the mathematical formulas of quantum theory to model cognitive phenomena, particularly those that cannot be modeled by Boolean logic and classical probability theory, usually referred to as judgment errors, decision-making errors, fallacies of human reasoning, irrational behaviors, and so on. Quantum cognition shows that we humans think and take decisions pretty much in a quantum-like way. This doesn't necessarily mean, however, that our brains would be like quantum computers, exploiting the existence of quantum effects at the micro level, although it certainly means that a quantum-like behavior is not the prerogative of the micro-entities, being instead a form of organization that can be found at different structural levels within our reality. Now, if the human conceptual entities are to be associated with a quantum-like behavior and therefore possess a sort of quantum nature, could it be that, the other way around, the microphysical entities are also to be associated with a conceptual-like behavior, and therefore would possess a conceptual natural similar to that of the human concepts? This is precisely the question that is at the origin of the conceptuality interpretation. Note, however, that different from the wave-particle duality, the quantumness conceptuality binomial would not be the expression of a relation of complementarity, but rather of a relation of similarity, in the sense that quantumness and conceptuality would just be two terms pointing to a same reality, or nature, which can manifest at different organizational levels within reality. So, if we were to synthesize the central point of quantum and also relativity theory in a simple and concise statement that anyone could understand, then according to the conceptuality interpretation, such statement would be that the stuff the world is made of is conceptual. When we say something like this, a warning is immediately needed. Consider electromagnetic and sound waves. They are very different entities, no doubts about that, but they can nevertheless share a same wavy natural, undulatory natural. Similarly, when we say that the stuff the world is made of is conceptual, this should not be understood in the sense that quantum and relativistic entities would be human concept, but in the sense that they would share with the latter a same conceptual natural, natural similar to how electromagnetic and sound waves can share a same wavy natural. What the conceptuality interpretation tells us is that human concepts are not the only category of conceptual entities with which we humans have so far interacted. The microscopic quantum entities would form another category of conceptual entities, in fact, more ancient and structured than the human ones. And the idea is that as soon as we start thinking of the microphysical entities not as objects but as conceptual entities, carrying meaning and exchanging it with the pieces of ordinary matter, most of the mystery of their behavior all of a sudden disappears. Now, to demonstrate the explicative power of the conceptuality hypothesis, there is only one way to proceed, proceed, which is to consider different quantum and relativistic situations among those considered to be not yet not yet fully understood, or even not understandable, and show that the conceptuality interpretation really allows one to solve the interpretational difficulties, and therefore represent a possible fundamental step forward in our understanding of the stuff our world is made of, 
and a candidate, a possible candidate, for the construction of a coherent framework for both quantum and relativity, relativity theories, maybe also more advanced evolutionary theories. But before doing so, let me express some additional words of caution. From the hypothesis that quantum entities would be conceptual entities, it is clear that a pan-cognitivist view naturally emerges, where everything within our reality would participate in cognition. With human cognition being just an example of it, expressed at a very specific organizational level. This, however, is not meant to be interpreted as an anthropomorphization of reality. This in particular because human cognition is to be considered as a much younger and hence still rather unsophisticated form of that more fundamental conceptual structure constituting the global reality. There is also no connection at all here with any type of idealistic philosophical views, while physical theories would be considered to be mere theories of human mental content. Quite on the contrary, the conceptuality interpretation is a genuine, realistic view where conceptual entities are seen as entities that can be in different states and be subjected to measurement processes which are processes not only of discovery of the property that were already actual, but also of creation of those properties that were only potential prior to the measurement and could become actual through its execution. Okay, let me start then by describing the well-known double-slit experiment. Richard Feynman used to say that it has in it the heart of quantum mechanics and contains the only mystery. Well, maybe not the only mystery, but certainly it contains part of it. Let me first briefly describe the experiment and show then how the mystery can go away if we only start thinking of the microphysical entities interacting with the double slit barrier, not as particles or waves, but as conceptual entities. For this, let me begin by recalling why the double slit experiment is impossible to explain in any classical way. The reason is simple. The localized impact on the detector screen seems to show that the entity in question are particle-like. On the other hand, the fringe pattern one observes when multiple impacts are collected reveals that what traverses the double slit is more like a wave phenomenon able to create interference effects. And since a wave is not a particle and vice versa, the observed behavior of the electrons cannot be consistently explained. More precisely, if they would be like small projectiles, then a compositional interpretation of the experiment should be possible. With the pattern of impact obtained when both slits are open being deducible from the patterns of impact obtained when these are opened one at a time instead of simultaneously. But let me explain. Consider first the situation where only one of the two slits say slit 1, is open. Then the probability distribution P1 of impact on the detection screen is compatible with the hypothesis that the electrons would be entities of a corpuscular nature. And same, of course, for the probability distribution P2 of impact on the detection screen when only slit 2 is open. Now, if the corpuscular hypothesis would be correct, the probability distribution of impact at the detection screen in the situation where the two slits are simultaneously open should be given by the uniform average of the probabilities P1 and P2 when only slit 1 and only slit 2 are open at a time. But this is not what we observe. So, even though the electrons appear to be corpuscular as they leave traces on the screen in the form of point-like impacts, 
they cannot be such as this is incompatible with the observed complex fringe pattern. Let me stress again that the one-slit probability distribution are compatible with the hypothesis that the elections would be entities of a corpuscular nature. It is really when both slits are simultaneously open that the distribution of impacts on the detection screen becomes incompatible with the corpuscular assumption, being no longer deducible as a uniform average of the one-slit distribution probabilities. Reasoning in probabilistic terms, this means that there will be regions on the detection screen where the probability of observing an electron will differ sensibly, sensibly from the value given by the uniform average of the one's lead probabilities, in the sense that there will be regions of overexposure corresponding to a probability overextension and regions of underexposure corresponding to a probability underextension, meaning that one has to correct the classical uniform average by introducing a third contribution, usually called the interference contribution, responsible for these overextension and underextension effects or constructive and destructive interference effects if a wave-like interpretation is used. Okay, let me now consider the hypothesis that the electrons are conceptual entities, that is, entities behaving in a way that is similar to how human concepts behave. And let us also assume that the measuring apparatus, and more specifically here the screen detector, is an entity sensitive to the meaning carried by the electrons and able to answer questions when these questions are addressed in operational terms by enacting them through the construction of a specific experimental arrangement. Of course, the screen detector mind-like entity does not speak our human language and will only communicate by means of signs that are the electron's traces of impact on its surface, which we have to correctly interpret. And for this, we have to understand what is the meaning that is attached to the impact appearing in the different location. Now, the question the screen mind entity is possibly answering by means of its pointillistic language is what is a good concrete example of an electron passing through slit 1 or 2? Here, I should immediately say that the very notion of passing through that I'm using is a human spatiotemporal way of interpreting the question that the measuring apparatus is answering. Let us just keep in mind that a more general and probably correct way to formulate such question would be something like, what is a good example of an effect produced by an electron having interacted with a double slit barrier? Indeed, when we say passing through, or even impact point, we are already attributing to the electron properties that it does not necessarily have. In other words, we are already looking at things from a human-centered, classical way, point of view. On the other hand, if passing through is more generally meant as a synthetic way to express the fact that the only regions of the internal volume of space occupied by the barrier, where there is a non-zero probability of detecting the electron, are the two empty regions of the two slits, then of course the notion of passing through can still be used to analyze the experiment without too much inconvenience. Okay, having said this, let us try to delve into the screen mind to understand how the fringe structure can emerge. For this, let us concentrate on its most salient feature, the central fringe, which is the one with a higher density of impacts, located at an equal distance from the two slits. This is where the screen cognitive entity is most likely to manifest an answer. To understand why, we can observe that an impact in the region of the central fringe 
corresponds to a situation of maximum doubt regarding the slit the electron would have used to cross the barrier, or even the fact that it would necessarily have passed through one or the other slits in an exclusive manner. Therefore, it constitutes a perfect exemplification in the form of an impact point on the screen of the concept an electron passing through slit 1 or 2. Now, if the region in between the two slits is a region of overextension, we also know that the two regions opposite the two slits are instead regions of underextensions, showing a very low density of impacts. To understand why, we can observe that an impact in the regions facing the two slits would not make us doubt about the slit through which the electron has passed. In other words, an impact point in the two regions opposite the slit would constitute a very bad exemplification of the concept an electron passing through slit 1 or 2. Moving then from these two regions away from the center, we will be back again in a situation of doubt, although less perfect than that expressed by the central region, so regions of overextension will manifest again, but this time less intense, and then again regions of underextension will come and so on, producing in this way the typical fringe pattern observed in experiments. Considering this conceptuality explanation of a double slit experiment, we see that the wave aspect associated with the electrons mathematically described by the wave function evolving according to Schrodinger equation, is just a convenient way to model, by means of constructive and destructive interference effects, the different overextension and underextension effects that result from the cognitive processes through which a good, concrete exemplar for an abstract conceptual entity is each time provided, when the interrogative context forces somehow the electronic conceptual entity to enter the spatiotemporal theater by means of a localized impact on the screen. And of course this impact should not be mistaken as a trace left by a corpuscular entity with a well-defined trajectory in space. Now, to confirm more credibility to this conceptuality narrative, and considering that an electron and a human concept are assumed to share the same conceptual nature, one should be able to also show that human minds can produce similar interference figures when subjected to interrogative contexts that confront them with genuine alternatives and therefore situation of doubt. And this is indeed the case. Human minds, when interacting with concepts, will generally produce overextension and underextension effects having a possibly very complex pattern, in fact, much more complex, much less symmetric than those produced by screen minds interacting with electrons or photons. Let me very briefly describe an experiment where this has been explicitly demonstrated. In the 80s of last century, the cognitive psychologist James Hampton conducted an experiment where 24 exemplars of food were submitted to 40 students. Exemplars like almond, acorn, peanut, olive, coconut, etc. Participants were first asked to choose exemplars of food in the collection that they considered to be good examples of fruit. And of course, Certain of them were selected more frequently than others, that is, with higher probability. This was the case, for instance, for Apple, which was the exemplar having the highest probability. Then, participants were asked to choose exemplars of food in the collection that they considered to be good examples of vegetable. And again, certain of them were selected more frequently, with broccoli having the highest probability. These two experimental situations are the analogue of the two situations in the double slit experiment where only one of the two slits is kept open at a time. The different exemplars of food play then the same role 
as the different locations on the detection screen in the double slit experiment, with the two concepts fruit and vegetable playing the role of slit 1 and slit 2. Now, the third situation considered by Hampton is instead the analog of the situation where both slits are simultaneously open, where participants were asked to choose examples of food in the collection that they considered to be good examples of fruit or vegetable. And again, experimental probabilities were deduced from the frequency with which the different exemplars were selected by the participants. Now, if the decision-making process of the students when subjected to this third interrogative context would be of a sequential kind, something like they first choose between fruit and vegetable and then, if they choose the former, they select a good example of fruit and if they choose the latter, they select a good example of vegetable. If this would be the case, then the probability of selecting a given example of food in this third situation should correspond to the uniform average of the probabilities describing the first two situations. But this is not what Hampton data reveal, which contain instead a complex pattern of overextension and underextension effects. Now, one can model this data in a quantum way using the superposition principle and the Born rule, which is the quantum rule of probabilistic assignment. As I said already, the one slit, one slit, only slit one open situation corresponds to the food being a fruit and can be associated with a wave function psi f. The only slit two open situation corresponds to the food being a vegetable and can be associated with another wave function, psi v. And the both slits open situation correspond to the fruit, to the food, sorry, being a fruit or vegetable, which can be associated with the superposition of the two wave functions, psi f and psi v, so psi f plus psi v. And one can then use for instance, two-dimensional functions to interpolate the data of the first two situations, then a normalized superposition of these two functions to interpolate the data of the first situation, and when one does so, one obtains something very interesting. So, let us see what the result is. For the first situation, corresponding to the food being a fruit, that is, the situation where only the fruit slit is open, we obtain a classical distribution of impacts on the exemplar screen, centered about around the apple impact, which, as I said before, is the one having the higher probability. For the second situation, corresponding to the food being a vegetable, that is, the situation where only the vegetable slit is open, we obtain Again, a classical distribution of impacts on the exemplar screen, centered around the broccoli impact, which is the one with the higher probability. Finally, in the third situation, corresponding to the food being a fruit or vegetable, that is, the situation where both the fruit and vegetables leads are open, the fig figure on the exemplar's detection screen we obtain is the following. A complex interference figure is thus revealed, reminiscent of those obtained in the phenomena of B refringence. In other words, human minds interacting with human concepts can produce interference like patterns similar to those produced by micro entity interacting with measuring apparatuses. Okay, let me come back for a moment to the wave-particle duality. Assuming that an interference pattern would be indicative of a wave and the absence of it would be indicative of a particle, 
Experiments like the double slit one are usually interpreted by saying that the behavior of a quantum entity, like an electron, is determined by the type of measurement one performs on it. This is certainly correct, but only if we understand that the determination arises in the moment the quantum entity is actually detected and not before. And this also means that if we do not want to abandon a realistic view of our physical reality, we have to accept that a microphysical entity, prior to its detection, is usually neither in a wave nor in a particle state, but in a condition that cannot be associated with any specific spatial property. Now, if we observe that conceptual entities are meaning entities that can be in different states, it immediately follows that, by definition of what a state is, a conceptual entity in a given state cannot be at the same time in another different state. I'm of course stating the obvious, but this is really what could be at the foundation of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. As an example, consider the human concept animal keeping in mind the parallel between the human concept animal and a microphysical entity like an electron, which according to the conceptual interpretation also possesses a conceptual nature. Such animal concept can be in different states. For instance, the dog, cat, horse states, conveying the meaning that the animal is a dog, the animal is a cat, the animal is a horse, and so on. And these, of course, are examples of rather abstract states, if compared to states that are determined by context that put, for instance, the animal concept in a one-to-one -one relation with a well-defined entity of our spatiotemporal theater. So, the conceptual combinations, like the following one, the Labrador dog named Esmeralda owned by actress Hannah Hathaway, or Cameron Diaz's white cat named Little Man, or the race horse named Lexington who set a record at the Matari course in New Orleans, and so on. All these are much more concrete states of the concept animal. So, a concept can be in different meaning states, but certainly it cannot simultaneously be in two different states, and some states are maximally abstract, others maximally concrete, and in between there are states, the majority of them, whose degree of abstraction or concreteness is intermediary, like for instance the state described by the conceptual combination, a cat owned by a celebrity. This means that a concept cannot be in a state that is maximally abstract and at the same time maximally concrete. And this is nothing but the conceptuality version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So, according to the conceptuality interpretation, Heisenberg's uncertainty relation are ontological statements describing the necessary trade-off between concreteness and abstractness, resulting from the fact that, at the ontological level, quantum entities would be conceptual meaning entities. But then, what about non-locality? Well, if we take quantum physics and its formal in seriously, we already know that in ultimate analysis, non-locality is really non-spatiality. Quantum entities are non-spatial in the sense that they are not permanently in space, as they cannot be permanently associated with spatial properties. But what is non-spatiality? Well, non-spatiality is abstractness. The non-locality of a micro-entity like an electron would simply express the fact that most of the electron states are abstract states with a subset of the maximally concrete states corresponding to those that can be associated with spatial properties. So, a spatiotemporal object 
is a conceptual entity in the limit situation where it can remain in a maximally concrete state for a prolonged time. In other words, non-locality means non-spatiality, which in turn is an expression of abstractness, whereas locality means spatiality, which in turn is an expression of concreteness. Okay, let me now change the topic of the discussion a bit and consider the notion of entanglement. Quantum entanglement is among the better study and experimentally better verified quantum phenomena and certainly one that appears to defy our common spatial sense, which is the reason why Einstein famously described entanglement as a spooky action at a distance. In a nutshell, Entangled systems are such that their parts can be spatially separated by arbitrary distances and still remain experimentally intimately connected. Experimentally speaking, entanglement is revealed by studying the correlations that are produced in so-called coincidence experiments. More precisely, the parts forming a system can be shown to be entangled when certain inequalities, called Bell's inequality, are violated by the data. A less well-known fact, however, is that ordinary macroscopic systems can also violate Bell's inequality. For this, it is sufficient that a third element is also present, connecting the parts, the subsystems, thanks to which correlation can be created during the coincidence measurements. Indeed, when there is a connective element, then when individual properties are created in a coincidence measurement, also correlations will be created, instead of being just discovered, which is what, in ultimate analysis, is responsible for the violation of Bell's inequality. This is the reason why systems like two dies connected through a rigid rod, breaking elastic bands, connected vessels of water, so-called quantum machine, can all violate Bell's inequality with all possible values. In that sense, we can say that entanglement is just the expression of the presence of a connective element which, by connecting the parts of a composite system, allows for the creation of correlation in coincidence experiments. But can we use this reasoning to also explain quantum entanglement? That is, entanglement appearing at the microphysical level? The problem is that there is nothing detectable in space between two spatially separated entangled quantum entities. So, through what do they connect in order to create the observed correlations? The answer provided by the conceptuality interpretation is actually very simple. Quantum entanglement is a connection through meaning. So, the ubiquitousness of entanglement in physics simply mirrors the ubiquitousness of the meaning connections that are unavoidably present in any conceptual realm. Clearly, as soon as two conceptual entities are allowed to meet in a given cognitive situation, a meaning connection will exist between them, whose strength will depend on how much meaning the two entities can share and exchange. Take the example of the concept animal, and the two exemplars, horse and beer. One can invite a certain number of individuals to select among these two exemplars the one they think is more representative of animal. So the two exemplars will be associated with different experimental probabilities, like 0 0.53 and 0 0.47, and this is a typical two-outcome measurement and let us call it measurement A. Take then a second concept, the concept acts, and again two exemplars, like Grohl's and Winnie's. Also in this case, we can ask individuals to select 
the most representative exemplars. So defining another two outcome measurement, say this time with outcomes probability 0.48 and 0.52, and let us call it measurement B. Now, the two concepts, animal and act, are evidently quite strongly meaning connected in most human semantic contexts. As we all know from our experience of the world that animals are living beings and that living beings can do different types of actions. This kind of meaning connection becomes perfectly evident when these two concepts are combined in a sentence like the animal acts. This sentence describes an entangled state of the composite conceptual entity formed by the concept animal and the concept acts. Almost all human minds will agree that such sentence possesses a full and perfectly understandable meaning. And if we now consider the previous two measurements in a joint, coincident way, defining what we can call measurement AB, consisting in asking participants to select now pairs of examples for these two concepts as representative examples of their combination, then certain pairs will obtain a very high probability compared to others, as it's clear that there are actions that certain animals will typically do that other animals will usually not do. No surprise, the horse whinnies and the beer growls are selected much more frequently as outcomes of this joint AB measurement, more frequently than the horse growls and the beer whinnies outcomes. And these overextensions and underextensions of probabilities are clearly due to the existing meaning, pre-existing meaning connections and cannot be explained by just considering the probabilities obtained in the previous two single measurements A and B. Now, if the statistics of outcome of joint measurement of this kind is analyzed in the same way physicists analyze data of Bell test experiment, the result is that Bell's inequality will be generally violated, and this with magnitudes similar to those of typical laboratory physics situation with entangled spins or entangled photons. So, we can explain entanglement in the conceptuality interpretation as the expression of a meaning connection between conceptual entities. And if this way of thinking about entanglement is correct, it also means that realism is not at stake when dealing with entanglement, as reality would not be fully contained in the spatiotemporal theater, and entangled quantum entity would be entities in more abstract states available to acquire spatial properties like locations and direction only when submitted to suitable contexts, like the measurement ones. In other words, we have to distinguish what connects entities and the effects that these connections can produce in terms of correlations, which can be created in the laboratory and which are processes where more concrete states exemplar or instantiation of abstract concepts can be jointly actualized. Okay, let me now consider another of the quantum conundrums, indistinguishability, and see how it can be convincingly, convincingly elucidated by the conceptuality interpretation. But first, let me briefly recall what the notion of indistinguishability is about. Entities that are indistinguishable are said to be identical, and identical means that they possess exactly the same set of attributes, that is, the same set of state-independent intrinsic properties, like, for instance, a same mass, charge and spin, as it is the case for all elementary micro-entities, for example, electrons. Now, identical entities although indistinguishable, are nevertheless individuals. This in particular because they have attributes that can be measured 
and used to count how many of them are present in a composite system. Hence, identical individuals are not necessarily a same individual. And what renders two entities distinguishable appears not to be what also confers them their individuality. The important point about indistinguishability is that it has profound consequences on the statistical behavior of identical entities when they are considered in a collective way. Take two entities, S1 and S2, and assume they can only be in two different states, Psi1 and Psi2. If they are distinguishable, then when considered as a system formed by two non-interacting sub-entities, they can be in a total of four possible different states. A state where they are both in state Psi1, a state where they are both in, a state, in state Psi2, a state where S1 is in state Psi1 and S2 is in state Psi2, and a state where it is the other way around. This is the so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann way of counting states. However, if the two systems S1 and S2 are genuinely indistinguishable, then the last two situations are one and the same situation, as by changing the role of the two entities there cannot be any observable effects. So, there are only now three states in total, and this way of counting states is called the Bose-Einstein way. Let me also mention for completeness the Fermi-Dirac way of counting, where not only the two entities are indistinguishable, but there is also the constraint saying that they cannot be jointly in the same state. So, the so-called Pauli's exclusion principle. Then, in the present situation, we would be left with only one possible state. Now, if the conceptuality interpretation correctly captures the nature of quantum entities, then quantum indistinguishability should appear also in the ambit of the human conceptual realm, at least to some extent, and produce non-classical statistics, not deducible from the Maxwell-Boltzmann way of counting states. Let us take the example of the abstract, abstract concept animal. We can consider a certain number of these animal concepts, say, ten of them. A collection of this kind can be described in our human language by considering the two concept combination ten animals. It is then clear that all the animal concepts in the ten animals combination are perfectly identical and all exactly in the same states state, or carrying exactly the same meaning, and at the same time we are truly in the presence of a collection of entity, not of a single one. In other words, the conceptual combination ten animals, in, in this conceptual combination, the quantum indistinguishability becomes perfectly self-evident, so that the conceptuality interpretation offers a very simple and clear explanation of it. This would not be possible for spatial objects, as it's clear that two spatial objects are never indistinguishable, as they always occupy different locations in space, so they are always in different spatial states. They can, in principle, all have the same intrinsic properties, but because of their spatiotemporal status, they will always be distinguishable. On the other hand, the fact that ten animals is a concept and not an object is crucial for it being able to carry this quantum theater of being many and at the same time being genuinely undistinguishable. Quantum indistinguishability thus becomes, as I said, perfectly self-evident in the conceptuality interpretation. But let us now consider two possible examples of animal, cat and dog to be considered as two possible states of animal, and more precisely, the states expressing the meaning that the animal is a cat and that the animal is a dog, respectively. We are therefore in the situation where there are 
11 different possible states in which the concept 10 animals can be in, if only the two examples of cat and dog are considered. The state, there is the state where there are 10 cats, the state where there are 9 cats and 1 dog, the state where there are 8 cats and 2 dogs, and so on, down to the state where there are 10 dogs. Now, if we assume that cat and dog states can be actualized with the same probability and that there are no ways to distinguish between the individual cats nor between the individual dogs, then the probabilities for obtaining all these states are all the same. And this equiprobable situation corresponds to the Bose-Einstein way of counting states. On the other hand, in case there would be an underlying reality allowing to make further distinctions, then all these states would have a so-called multiplicity. And we are then in the Maxwell-Boltzmann situation with a typical bell-shaped curve, centered here in the state five cats and five dogs, as it gives rise to the highest number of possible combination when considering all the possible ways that five cats can exchange their roles and same for the five dogs. But can we then find evidence for the deviation from the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistic to the Bose-Einstein one due to the indistinguishability of the individual animal concepts in the combination 10 animals? A possibility is to consider the World Wide Web as a mind-like entity that can tell different stories associated with all its searchable web pages. In this way, one can perform counts using a search engine like Google and use the obtained numbers as an estimate of the different probabilities. When doing so, we have to exclude from the calculation the two extremal, extremal states, 10 cats and, then, and 10 dogs, as this combination will give counts that are orders of magnitude greater than all the others, and this because the sentence 10 cats does not contain the dog word, and thus can easily combine with all possible other words, and the same for the sentence 10 dogs. So, excluding these anomalies, here is the result of these web counts. As we can see, data are more typical of a Bose-Einstein statistic with some added fluctuation than a classical Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. And in fact, experiments performed on human subjects confirm what emerges by performing these Google counts. Many human concepts do actually obey a Bose-Einstein-like statistics. More specifically, one observes that the passage from the Bose-Einstein statistics corresponding to a perception of strict indistinguishability of the concept to a classical Maxwell-Boltzmann one, this passage depends on the concepts and exemplar considered in the experiments, in the sense that the easier it is to relate these concepts to our everyday life situation, and the more the obtained statistic will tend towards the Maxwell-Boltzmann one. On the other hand, the less the human imagination is influenced by real situation and can run free, the more the Bose-Einstein statistics will appear. Okay, many other typical quantum mechanical situations could be analyzed in the light of this intriguing conceptual interpretation, like the delay choice experiments, or more generally, the measurement problem itself, which are typical of the situation of the behavior of a conceptual entity whose state can change from a more abstract to a more concrete one when interacting with a cognitive-like structure sensitive to the meaning it carries. Of course, the fact that a measurement is like an interrogative process, this is a metaphor which can be used and is used independently of the conceptual interpretation. Indeed, a scientist, by means of a measurement, certainly interrogates the system subjected to it, and the outcome is the answer it gets. But this is a description only at the human cognitive level. 
which is necessarily always present in a scientific experiment, as it's clear that science is a human activity. The conceptual interpretation, however, adds a new cognitive la layer, that of the meaning-driven interaction between the measured entity and the measure measuring apparatus. Having said that, I'd like now to conclude this introductory explore, exploration of the fertility of the conceptual interpretation by also providing a new way of explaining relativistic phenomena. Indeed, not only the quantum phenomena, but also the relativistic ones do challenge our classical prejudice and as I'm now going to show, also for them the conceptual interpretation can help us shed some light on their possible origin. I will here only consider the phenomenon of time dilation in typical Langevin twin paradox situations. Consider two cognitive entities A and B, both reflecting on a problem and both starting with the same hypothesis. Assume that cognitive entity A needs eight conceptual steps to reach a given conclusion starting from said, said hypothesis. Assume also that cognitive entity B only needs four conceptual steps to reach that same conclusion. Imagine also that entity A wants to keep track of her cognitive path and for this she decides to introduce an axis to parametrize each one of her eight conceptual steps. Let us call this axis the time axis of A. Imagine that entity A is also willing to keep track of the cognitive path of entity B and this consistently with the fact that they are at the same place, so to say, when they share the starting hypothesis and that they can meet again at a common place when they reach the same conclusion. Well, not places in the sense of space, but places in a realm of a conceptual nature. We assume here that A and B are equivalent entities in the sense that when they take a cognitive step, they always do so at the same speed or if you prefer, that these steps have always the same length, in a certain sense. However, since B is able to reach the same conclusion in half the number of steps of A, A cannot represent the path of B on the same axis, as units were precisely chosen on this axis in a way that one needs twice the number of steps to reach the final conclusion. So. A has to find a different way to represent the cognitive process of B by introducing an additional axis to describe B as moving on a round trip path which will be now contained in a higher dimensional space generated by the first parametric axis which we call the time axis of A and this second parametric axis let us call it the space axis of A. So, entity B is now described as following a conceptual path that moves away from the initial hypothesis point on the time axis and then comes back to reach the conclusion point, always located on the time axis, by doing exactly four cognitive steps. However, if we consider this construction from a purely Euclidean perspective, we immediately see that there is a problem. Indeed, if we calculate the length of the beef path using the Pythagorean theorem, we will necessarily find a longer path than that walked by A. By a. But we know that B follows a shorter conceptual path, as it's clear that B only uses half of the conceptual steps used by A. Accordingly, when measuring its conceptual length, this should be shortened shorter and not longer than that of the path followed by A. So, for A to fix this problem, so to say, there is only one way to go. It has to consider a pseudo-Euclidean space instead of a Euclidean one, 
and more precisely that specific pseudo-Euclidean space known as the Minkowski space or space-time. In the latter, distances are not calculated using the Pythagorean theorem, but by using a pseudo-Pythagorean theorem that attaches a negative sign to the squares of the components associated with the space axis, and a positive one to the square of the components associated with the time axis. In this way, the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle, whose cateti are respectively associated with the time and space axis, will generally be less than the length of the time catetus. So, from the viewpoint of this more fundamental conceptual realm, time dilation effects are perspective effects due to the individual space-time constructions. Entity A perceives entity B as if producing cognitive steps having an increased duration. B appears to reason more slowly, but since it also reasons more efficaciously, using a, less, a lesser number of cognitive steps, A and B can still meet again at the common conclusion point. However, this is just how things appear to be at the level of the individual space-time construction operated by A. At the more objective level of the non-spatiotemporal conceptual semantic space, both A and B would move at exactly the same speed, which is the speed of light. So, relativity theory appears to also point to the existence of a non-spatiotemporal realm of a conceptual nature, with all physical entity somehow surfing over it at the same speed, incessantly producing new, new conceptual steps. The idea is that we don't see entity, entities moving in space because they would actually move in an objective, substantive, spatial container, but because we would confer them a spatial movement in order to keep them inside our personal representation in a consistent way. And in the relat relativistic formalism, the clue that all entities would move at the intrinsic velocity which is the velocity of light, can be found in the fact that the length of so-called four velocity vectors is always equal to the value of the speed of light. OK, it is time to conclude. And for this, let me mention John Wheeler's famous it from bit epitome, which he used to indicate that all things physical are information theoretic in origin in a participatory universe. The conceptuality interpretation somehow completes Wheeler's account in two different ways. First of all, by extending the notion of participant, which is not limited to humans create meaning by operating measurement devices, as these devices, and more generally all pieces of matter, would themselves be meaning-sensitive entities able to exchange information independently of the presence of the human consciousnesses. Secondly, by observing that bit, understood as a unit of measure in meaning exchanges, is not what combines to construct the physical entities of our spatiotemporal environment or to more generally produce the different physical phenomena, what combines is not the bits of information, but the conceptual entities carrying such information, which participate in a grand conversation where the different cognitive participators at different organizational levels constantly exchange streams of meaningful information. OK, this time now to provide some references, hoping that some of you were intrigued by this interpretation, and want to go deeper in its understanding. From 2009 to 2014, you have a number of articles written by Arts in which he lays the foundation of the interpretation, which are those you can see on the screen. Regarding the importance of the conceptuality approach 
to relativity, he has also published a recent article in Foundations of Science. And by the way, all these articles are also present in their preprint version on the archive of Cornell University. See, for instance, the links below the video. Some of the ideas of a conceptuality interpretation are also explored in a recent book I had the pleasure of writing with art, aimed at a more general audience, although I have to say that the focus of the book is a different one. But this is certainly a place where the general reader can more easily start. Finally, there is an article we are currently finalizing for the Proceedings of the Words of Entanglement Symposium, which will be published in a special issues of Foundation of Science and which I hope will provide you a nice and easy to read overview of the subject. So, thanks for watching.